life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details. And survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. I am Marshall. I'm Lainey. And I am Corey. So today we're talking about Season 2, Episode 2, entitled Bloodletting. And I think that this title kind of applies to quite a few things in this episode, Mm -hmm. so we'll talk about that as we go along. So, a few stats about this episode that are kind of interesting. This episode was written by Glenn Mazzara. And directed by Ernest Dickerson. Bloodletting was first broadcast on October 23rd, 2011 on AMC in the US. The episode received 6.70 million viewers. That's how decimals work, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Along with becoming the highest rated program on basic cable for the night, Bloodletting became the second highest rated program of the week on basic cable, scoring higher than the season finale of Jersey Shore. As it should be. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Just for reference, Lainey and I gave the first episode of Jersey Shore 10 minutes before we were like, no. True that. Not all reality shows are my bag. So let's just jump right into this episode. Right, then. let's do that. And it's flashback time. <sighs> yes, it is. So before we had a flashback of Shane and Rick when they were in the car, in the police car, before they went chasing after the criminals. And now we kind of have a similar situation in that Lori is outside of the school waiting to pick up Carl. And she's talking to her friend and... And she's also talking about the conversation that she had with Rick that morning. She says that she and Rick got in a fight and that he wasn't being a jerk, but it pushed her buttons. And she admits to goading him and being irrational about it, which is, you know, that's some good self-realization there, Lori, I think. Yeah, but at the same time, if you remember what he was saying... What really stuck with him in that conversation was that she was saying that he wasn't being there for them. This thing that she said to him that has kind of stuck with him and has plagued him a little bit throughout this first season, and we might still see signs of it in the future seasons, this is all her just trying to get a reaction out of him. Mm-hmm. Trying to get him to give her drama. Well, the thing about that is, too, is whenever there's drama, there's trauma. So there's something from her... Past that unfortunately we never really see. They don't do a lot of flashback on her family life. We don't know about her yeah. father. If she has father issues, there's something there. I really think there's something there. There probably is some sort of father issues there, given the way that she tends to react towards other people of authority. If I wanted to go stereotypical there in the South, she's a preacher's kid. So then Shane shows up to the schoolyard to talk to Lori. And he's in car 162. And if you remember when we talked about this before, the car that both Shane and Rick drive in and the car that Rick later takes after the zombie apocalypse when he goes to find the people at the Atlanta Survivor Camp is number 134. So they're not in the same car that they were in before. Correct. But that other car was in the shootout and was being used as a shield. So it's very likely that it's in the shop getting its sides buffed out getting all the bullet holes taken out of it right so that when he when he goes back to pick it up it's not there but that means they repaired it sometime between the day he gets shot and the day that he leaves because there's a zombie apocalypse going along and why wouldn't they be repairing cars but it's, you know this is rationalization probably right it's no li- yeah it's literally just parts at that point They're right really no it is you know but the, you know part of our job on this podcast really is to take these small little stupid minute details and try to put them together. In my head, the math doesn't add up. It's, but it, that's fine. Yeah, because it is a small town, so that, that, that puts yeah. them at a hindrance to be able to do that. Yeah, that's true. I don't believe it, but we'll move on. Yeah. Uh, so Lori immediately knows when Shane gets out of the car that something is up with Rick. Uh, she's like, immediately is like, what happened? And Shane takes the blame for it. And he said, you know, it was my fault. I wasn't protecting him or whatever. And then you see Lori go over and tell Carl there's no words going on in this scene when she's telling Carl. But Carl immediately starts to break down and you Mm -hmm. can see it. And you see Shane's reaction to the whole thing. It's just such an interesting 
scene, in my opinion, because of you kind of see, again, Shane's want to be a part of that family, but he's really not. There is a note I wanted to make about Shane in that Robert Kirkman did say this about him. A lot of people think of Shane as a clear villain and he did a bad thing. But if you really analyze that situation, he's a good guy and has done the right thing at every turn because he's done that and it's not working out for him. It's driving him crazy. So we really wanted to show that he's a tragic figure much more than a villainous figure. It's just a series of unfortunate situations that have led to him slowly losing himself in this world. Popping back in time and showing his concern for Rick and how he cares for Lori and Carl, I thought that would be a good thing to do. What do you guys think about that? Here's my thing. Did they talk about, like, they've known each other a, a long time, Shane and, Shane and, uh, yeah. and Rick? Yeah, and Rick, yes. Okay, so let's let's paint the scene. High school buddies, right? Right. Yep. Rick probably had a good home. Either he had a really good home or he had a bad home and he did, and he turned it around, unlike what Lori's doing. Shane's the guy that would probably spend as much time at Rick's house as he, as he could because his home, there's no way Shane came from a good home. There's the way he acts. He wants love so badly that he's willing to go, okay, I'm now insta-family with them, right? That seems to be, if I just presuppose... If they've known each other that long, that seems to be a fairly simple but probably realistic assessment of their relationships. Yeah, but that doesn't really talk about what he is saying about Shane. So in my opinion, what Rick Kirkman is saying is very oxymoronic of how he has written him to be. He says that he's done the right thing at every turn. And I don't believe that that is true. And I think that that the very first time we meet Shane, we have seen that not to be true. When he's talking about women in a certain negative connotation, he does not do the right thing at every turn. I see what Robert Kirkman is trying to say, but I don't think it's necessarily true. I agree with you, your assessment of what Shane has done. I think a lot of these quotes that he's giving about Shane, and I've seen a few others... I don't know if he's really seeing Shane clearly at, in, mm-hmm. as, his, as he's writing it. I feel like he is seeing things from Shane's perspective. In Shane's perspective, he thinks that he's doing the right thing all the time. He thinks that he's making the right tactical decisions. He's making the right protective decisions. But the interpersonal decisions are not right. Mm, yes, The way exactly. that he treats people is very selfish. It's very inside his own mind. He makes a lot of excuses for what he does. Mm -hmm. So from Shane's perspective, he's a good guy. He's doing the right thing. He's taking care of these people. And he's doing this in a very soldier mentality. Again, I really feel like he is a vet. He has to be. Because when he then comes back, he's completely cut off from his brother's. And the closest thing that he can see to a true family again is his good buddy Rick and that family. And when Rick is out of the picture, this is now my family. And I'm going to be Rick. I'm going to have what he had. He may not think of it like that, but there's a part of him there that wants what Rick had. Mm -hmm. It's obsessive. Mm -hmm. You know, it really is definitely obsessive. Um, But if you look, the way the actor portrays him... In everything he does, there's this, I have pain. I've had pain from the moment you see me on screen in this. You could see in that first car scene, you could see there's pain. So much pain in his life. Are you talking about the actual actor or? I'm saying, I don't know if you how you feel about the actor and how he prepares. Well, I will tell you, I did research on him and that's a whole other podcast. But I do have to say that a lot of times the character of Shane And some of the choices that he has made, the actor has made in his life, might parallel. Yeah, absolutely. You can look up podcasts if you're really curious. We're not going to go into it here. But he has been very open about things in his past, even while he was an actor. Struggles that he had. So yeah, Mm -hmm. it's raw for him. It's real for him. It's not 100% 
character made out of whole yeah. cloth, but yeah. After the credits, Rick is running with Carl, and he is running to Herschel's farm with Otis. Now, Otis is a new character that we have, and it is played by an actor called Pruitt Taylor Vince. Most of you might know him from Stranger Things back in 2017. He was also in a really fun thriller that we have all in this room seen called Identity back in 2003. He was in one of my all-time favorite movies, JFK, and he was in one of my favorite 80s movies, Mississippi Burning. Otis says, yeah, you should go to Herschel's farm. It's not very far, so they're off and running. Then Maggie sees Rick out in the distance. Maggie, we'll talk about her in just a minute, but honestly, she is my like other really favorite character. She has quite a story arc, even now, because while we did talk about the fact that there were only three OGs, Maggie is back. So technically there are four, once yeah. again, but yeah. for a time there was only three. So Maggie goes and gets all the people in the house and says, everybody come on out. So Herschel comes out with his family to see what's going on. So we have some new characters as well, and we're going to talk about them. So first, we have Maggie Green, and she is played by Lauren Cohen. What you might know her from is she's one of the Marthas from Batman vs. Superman. She played uh, Martha Wayne in mm-hmm. the tragic origin scene, bad dream that he was having. And Robert Kirkman is nothing if not loyal. He has uh, put her into his new animated Animazon series, Invincible, as well as Kit Glenn and a lot of some other uh, veterans from Walking Dead. Next we have Herschel Green, and he is played by Scott Wilson. He was in one of my favorite movies of the 60s, and the first movie to have a black man slap a white man in the heat of the night. He was also in The Last Samurai, the Tom Cruise uh, movie, and he was also in a movie called Way of the Gun from the screenwriter of Usual Suspects and now director of the Mission Impossible movies. Another one of my favorites, and he was also in the show Justified. And next we have Patricia. There is no last name, but I think she's either married to or with Otis. Neither one of them have a last name in this, so whatever. Patricia is played by an actress named Jane McNeil. We also have Maggie's sister, Beth, and uh, Beth is played by Emily Kinney. You might know from her internet sensation, Princess Rap Battle, which <laughs> she's a Disney princess rapping. I didn't see which one she played. I, I didn't do that far into the research. I know that Sarah Michelle Gellar is uh, Cinderella in it, so it's pretty cool. But she's also known for the Arrowverse. She's been in both Flash and Arrow. And lastly, we have a guy who is playing Beth's boyfriend, Jimmy, and he's played by James Allen McCoon. So everyone's out there on the porch, and Herschel asks if Carl was bit. No, he wasn't. So then everybody kind of comes together to help Carl. So Herschel's house was a farmhouse a little ways away from Atlanta. They found it while they were location scouting. And fun fact, the barn that's on the property was actually built specifically for the show. It did not reside on the property with the farmhouse at the time that they had found it. So that's kind of a cool thing that they built that barn from scratch. So then as they're bringing Carl in, Rick reveals he is the same blood type as Carl. I didn't really make a note of the type of blood type that he is. Uh, I believe it was A positive or I A think negative. Right. But yeah, I think, it was I think it's positive. like something like that. And then Otis reveals that the bullet went through the buck, which slowed the bullet down and probably saved his life. However... The bullet did break into pieces once it went into Carl. Once there is a gunshot, and the rest of the group that's kind of going around in the forest, I think it's like Lori and Andrea, Daryl, Carol, they're looking for Sophia. And they hear the gunshot, and they decide that they're going to go back to the RV. And as they're doing it, Andrea and Carol are like kind of commiserating while Daryl tries to comfort by saying that hoping and praying is a waste of time because they're going to find Sophia. So he's not really the best at comforting Mm -mm. them, but at the same time, it's also kind of sweet that Daryl is the one who's trying to be positive about it all and saying, yeah, we're going to find her. And it does kind of have an effect on Carol. She's kind of like, okay, that's kind of what I needed to hear. Like, yeah. I needed some positivity on this. A, center, a somewhat centered man. He's not completely centered. More centered than her husband. Yeah. So then Dale, as we find out, is still scavenging for more parts for the RV. He's trying to grab everything he can just in case it breaks down again from this big pile of vehicles that they're in. T-Dog is in a lot of pain and his gash is infected. So they're trying to find drugs 
for the infection. He he says that his name is Theodore Douglas. Um, like, okay, now I get why you're calling yourself T Dog, and why like everywhere in this you're just T Dog. Mm-hmm. It is literally just the first chunk of his last name and T. I, uh-huh. I, this, I it makes a whole lot of sense for me. <laughs> right. As he's in this car, he finds this magazine. It was really hard. I took probably about 10 minutes trying to line up the shot to see what is this magazine. It was very hard. But on the back part of it, it says a rare opportunity in East Cobb. And it looks like some kind of real estate magazine. So I did a bunch of searching online. And from what I can tell, this is the back cover of Atlanta Homes and Lifestyle magazine. It actually still exists today. But I couldn't really find, and they use that phrase, a rare opportunity in East Cobb, in a lot of their episodes of their ma- magazine. But I really couldn't find, like, that exact one at all. And it does mention something, like, in the low 230s is the is a figure that you could see at the bottom of that back page. So, yeah, I think that they're talking about, you know, purchasing really expensive homes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He also finds cigarettes and a, ba- a bloody baby seat in the back seat. And that that's not just blood going on there. There there's some there's some nastiness. It's mm-hmm. not diaper nastiness either. It, it's the it's the other main mass of the baby, and that's that's really sad. Yes. So then we return back to Herschel's farm, and Rick talks about. So then Shane compares Rick's injury to Carl because you know Carl got shot, Rick got shot. That's kind of interesting that there's this comparison you don't really think about you know Mm -hmm. like father like son that they're both recovering from bullet wounds and to see that what happened with rick was the fact that he went unconscious for so long and how much carl has to endure the same thing not in a hospital is a little mind-blowing actually when you think about it carl is screaming from the pain of the bullets and as they're taking one of the pieces out he then passes out from the pain and i'm just saying like his crying during this scene is so intense. Like, I have a hard time listening to it. There's only, like, one other one that I've heard that was this bad. During Doctor Sleep, Jacob Tremblay, when all the, the evil psychic vampires are killing him. Oh, yeah. He is so intense there. I feel like somebody is really torturing a child. Mm. I can't handle that. It was so harsh. As a note, just to lighten the mood that Marshall brought into this, during that scene, <laughs> at the end of it, he was like, ah, I got you guys. I, I, you guys were trying to kill me, and I made you guys cry. Ah. <laughs> yeah, because even the like, other actors couldn't handle his crying. Yeah. Yeah. So Herschel says, one bullet down and five to go, meaning fragments of bullets. And then Rick is giving Carl a blood transfusion. Shane is being very supportive about it, which is nice. And he makes a very unusual compliment about how strong Lori is. I think he says it to Rick. You know, Mm -hmm. Lori is a very strong woman. And in my mind, I'm like, say it to her face, yo. (laughs) I mean, I I get it. You're comforting Rick and stuff. But these are things that you need to say to the woman's face. Yes. As well. After that whole conversation, Herschel needs to open Carl up, find some internal bleeding, and get the rest of the fragments out. But he needs a respirator and more supplies. So Otis and Shane volunteer to go to the FEMA shelter. And one thing I do want to bring up here, and I did a little bit of research onto this particular point. Even medical professionals these days, they will be making this kind of mistake when they say respirator. They actually mean ventilator because a respirator is just the mask. Uh, What's really strange, and maybe we'll talk about this when we get to the other part, is that they say that respirator. And one of the things that I think they find in FEMA is an intubator. Correct. (laughs) Which I don't think they ever use. They might. Maybe they just don't show it. I can't remember. But But he was the EMT, so he knew what it was. He knew what it was. And he knew that it could be very important. Because if you've ever watched a medical show, you've seen them use those things. Especially Grey's Anatomy and lately. He was very happy to get his hands on that intubator. And then Maggie gets on her horse and tries to go bring at least Lori, if not the rest of the group, back to the farmhouse. The first Western image of Maggie. And, of course, the rest of the group, they're still heading back to that RV, too. So they're not even back where Dale and the RV are yet. On the farm, Shane and Otis are going to the FEMO shelter. And Rick gives Otis his gun, which is ironic because the dude just shot his son. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of one of those moments where you're like, wow, Rick, that's... 
kind of a that's trust a moving a moving point i think Mm -hmm. yeah it's funny because there's two ways to kind of look at that there is that like rick is very logistical like he can make those snap decisions even though he didn't seem to be the best at it all the time as a sheriff there was a little bit of issues there when they were showing the flashback there is a thing that he struggles with too it's this weakness and this passiveness Mm -hmm. and the the passiveness to laurie and that you ultimately will see churning in rick as as we go through the thing it's the thing he struggles with he he, he's the nice guy and he takes pride in being the nice guy, but sometimes you can't be the nice guy. And so that's what I'm seeing that a little bit in that moment, too. And one thing that I notice as the truck starts to drive away, the license plate is ES3L251. And it is from Georgia, although the city or district that it is from is white. I think they actually put a piece of white tape over it. The entire license plate seems really faded. And we're going to get to why that is important in just a moment. Yes, because we're going to go back to the highway and we see that Dale has found a couple things in his scavenging, including a guitar, batteries, trendy pink water, which looks like it's a Gatorade or some Mm. other kind of sports drink, and a machete. And T-Dog is currently sitting against the RV, which has a license plate, ES3L251 from Fulton, Georgia. It's the same license plate, except less faded, and you can actually see the Fulton on there. So they just moved the license plates around on the cars. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) They do not find any drugs except for ibuprofen. So that's not the greatest for T-Dog, but at least it'll help with some of the pain. T-Dog observes that he and Dale are the quote-unquote weakest, the old guy and the black guy. So stereotypically, they're the weakest. I don't necessarily agree with that statement at all, because I feel like what they bring to the table in strength is in their brains, really. Yeah. You know, Dale is incredibly smart and observant, Mm -hmm. and T-Dog is just brave and kind and you know accepting of more than other people are uh the moral center that's really what dale is the first moral center of this and that's what gets tested all throughout the series Mm -hmm. is uh, how long can you hold on to the moral center before you have to do what needs to be done the other the other reason why he's saying that is that you know given how he's feeling right now he's saying that the leaders of the group right now are two cowboys and a redneck that he helped put his brother in a bad spot Mm -hmm. so he's figuring as a as the black guy here he's going to be in trouble but rick would never do that and that's what dale is going on about right and i don't even think shane would do that yeah probably not t-dog thinks that he and dale should just leave which i think is funny because everyone wants to leave yeah we get it you you all want to leave because you all think that being away from the group is going to be better for you but it's not And then we find out that he's really just got a high fever and he's probably starting to get a little bit delirious from his infection. Yeah. So then the rest of the group is on its way back to the RV and Daryl says they are about 100 yards out. I kind of did a little math and looked this up, but depending on how slow you walk, that could be anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour to get back to where the RV is. And then a walker comes out of nowhere and it was kind of a cool shot because here's Andrea walking along and she walks in front of like a batch of trees. And as she comes out the other side, there's a walker right next to her that was not there before. And it was like kind of this cool visual. Yeah, it just kind of walked up right along at the same speed that she was walking up. Uh-huh. So it looked like it appeared out of nowhere. Yeah. And I, I was looking at that scene over and over again because I was trying to get a screenshot to put in here for you guys to see of the look on her face when that thing comes out. Her. and she's just like and, and it's so hilarious especially when she's just sitting there screaming after yeah that. i was like come on you've got a knife in your hand andrea just stab him <laughs> why are you just standing there screaming come on now andrea is a fr- point of frustration i think we mentioned it before and we we'll probably mention it again as long as she's on the show she gets better <laughs> and then on the other side you see maggie running up on the horse and takes that walker out she is no fear 
I find this a little funny too. Yeah, yeah, I've said Maggie is my fave, but here's why I find this funny. So Maggie lives in a farmhouse. They don't really, I mean, they have to scavenge. I understand this, but I have a feeling she doesn't really get out of the house much once the apocalypse started. Andrea, on the other hand, has been living on the street in the woods, in a camping ground, not very secure, in my opinion. And she's acting like this. Yeah. And along comes Maggie, probably from the farmhouse, who just takes a bat to it and moves on with life. And along comes Maggie. (laughs) Did, Did anybody else notice that she's putting the baseball bat in the rifle sling yes. for for the horse's saddle. Yes. I thought that was really yeah, fun. It's awesome. smart. Totally smart. So Maggie takes charge, asks who which one of you is Lori, says you need it back at the farm, come with me. So she takes Lori off and tells everybody where to go to meet up with them later. The zombie reanimates because even though the zombie has been hit by the baseball bat, it's not quite dead. And Daryl shoots him. The rest are just like standing there like, what the heck just happened? Like there was a walker. This chick ran up on her horse, took Lori. And now what are we doing? What's going on? (sighs) So bewildered. (laughs) (laughs) Now we're going back to the highway and the rest of the group arrives and tell, they tell Dale that Carl was shot. And Glenn says, and this is my favorite quote from this episode. All I know is this chick rode out of nowhere, like Zorro on a horse and took Lori. (laughs) The best. Which is Glenn in love. I think we, we haven't even gotten to the part where, where he talks about Maggie's the farmer's daughter. Yeah, we haven't talked about that yet. Yeah. It's coming, I think, in a couple in a future episode. So now we're at the farm, and Herschel says that this farm has been in his family for 160 years as he's talking to Rick about it. Now, that's really cool. They did lose Herschel's uh, wife and Herschel's stepson already. He makes a very interesting point to say that mankind's been fighting plagues from the start. We get our behinds kicked for a while and then we bounce back. And this whole conversation from like pretty much from the beginning of this scene, if you were to have them be talking about coronavirus, it would not have been changed a single word. So correct. I felt the same way. It it was perfectly they're talking about coronavirus now. Um, this is why it's perfect time for us to go through this again. Yes. Mm-hmm. To to exercise these demons we've had low these year. Maggie rides up with Lori. From what I can see, Rick's watch is at 2 p.m., maybe 2.02. But it's kind of dusky outside, so it doesn't totally match the fact that it's 2.02. However, as we have talked about in the beginning of the previous episodes, maybe this is where the props people have started to make the clocks and watches match the episode number. So if we're at 202, we are in episode two of season two. Maybe that's what's happening now. I do notice, however, in a later episode, they do not do that. Interesting. Maybe it. Maybe it's just, Maybe you know, they're just they now starting started. to figure that mm-hmm. out. Yeah, like it, it's one person did it for this one. And then he tells everybody else, and they're like, that's a cool idea, let's do that. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, TV is different directors every episode a lot of the time, so... So they keep taking blood from Rick, and taking blood from Rick, and he is so pale he can't even stand up, really. And at that point, Herschel reveals, now that Lori is here, that he is a veterinarian. Lori is shocked, but in a way, and this is just from an outsider's perspective, I think she's lucky to have anyone with any medical knowledge at all. Seriously, veterans have been fixing mob wounds for years. I mean, that's the whole thing. You do. You don't go to the hospital because they have to report to the police. Even doctors learn on other animals before they do humans. I mean, in my biology class, I learned on a pig. This is basic. So I don't really think that him being a veterinarian is that concerning, in my opinion. I would be grateful to have someone with that kind of knowledge. And when she's going on, like, well, when... When did you do this procedure before? Did you want a cow or a pig? Actually, nowadays, they're developing pigs in a way so that they can be alternate organ replacements for humans. Yeah, especially like pig valves for your heart and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So all of this, even if he has done it on a pig before, eh, he's probably just fine to be doing it on a human. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's it. there's two sides to this. It's easy to get frustrated with Lori. We always will. I never will defend her. But if you're a mother and your kid's being shot, you're going to be in shock and you're going to be like, ah, you know, like that. Right, yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Next, we're at the FEMA shelter. 
The FEMA shelter is actually the Noonan High School in Noonan, Georgia, and they were filming at it in July of 2011 after obtaining approval from the city council and the Coeta County school system. The location was temporarily renovated to mirror an abandoned federal emergency management agency camp. Now, as they're coming in there, there are a ton of walkers milling around the yard. There's a Humvee, there's some cop cars, and there's an ambulance. One of the things that kind of bugs me about this scene, they're coming up to this little hill that then leads into the parking lot. And the very first thing that comes up is an open ambulance. And in these open ambulances, one of the standard things that's in there is a ventilator. There's also, there should be a crash bag as well, but it's not unlikely that the crash bag has already been raided and taken away by somebody who's just looking for the drugs. But a good number of the things that they need on their list for this surgery is right there in that ambulance. And they just walked right past it. Otis, being a volunteer EMT, would know all the things that are in there that they need. So they could have grabbed a good chunk of what they needed right there and he they didn't even bother wow well, was the door open yeah okay well that's the thing as though. well as the side panels we're back at the highway and the group was talking about whether they can leave to go to the farm or whether they should stay and wait for sophia so daryl dale and, and andrea all decide to stay glenn, they say okay glenn you're gonna go to the farm and you're gonna take t-dog because t-dog is not doing so hot and they go in carol's cherokee now i wanted to point this out because i didn't read i've been calling it carol's suv but it's apparently a jeep cherokee and now it makes me wonder if jeep did some kind of sponsorship because we had shane in the jeep and a jeep cherokee but you know that episode four of this season is called cherokee rose and the cherokee rose is actually a theme that happens quite a bit in this series for different reasons and so i thought well did they put her in a cherokee knowing that this Cherokee Rose thing was going to happen. I don't know, but I thought I'd point it out, maybe. Yeah, we'll have to see if it's in the comic, because then that would definitely would have the forethought to know to put that right. in there. Right. And then Daryl, he has a bag of drugs that he's going to look and see if there's anything for T-Dog. So he reveals that he has practically a pharmacy of narcotics stored <laughs> in a bag on his motorcycle. Astute AMC audiences noticed that the bag contained Walter White's unique blue meth yeah, from right. the hit series Breaking Bad. Robert Kirkman also confirms that this is true. And they all belonged to Merle. There's also this theory going around that because he had the blue meth, that he probably knew Jesse. That they That's who Merle bought from because they talk about this like wiry kid, like this wiry guy that they bought the drugs from. So they think... They think it could be Jesse. Actually, there's a guy named Skinny Pete that's actually uh -huh. one of Jesse's pushers. Uh huh. So it could have been him. Yes. So I I don't know if we talk about that later when they talk about that guy, but there's a, there's a lot that says this is definitely crossover universe. So what what is it that he has in this bag? Well, he's got Crystal X, Oxy, and painkillers because Merle got the clap, and I'm not surprised. Oh uh, well, it wasn't just that the painkillers were for the clap. It's also these antibiotics. So he's got all of these like recreational drugs. And then he, he's also got the antibiotics for the after effects. Correct. <laughs> all right. Now we're back at FEMA. This was kind of a hard scene for me because it was so dark. And I was trying to see everything that was on the cop cars and, every, and all the buildings. It was just very hard for me. When we're starting out, Chain is by a police car that is from Linfield County maybe i can't really see the door only the lynn part so i tried to look up if there was such a thing as linfield county could not find it i don't know and in uh, fact all the counties in the area of where this is going on i can't find any that even start with l right they use flares to distract the zombies so that they can make it into the trailer part and i, I have a, i have an issue with this because you can distract them for a little while, but the way that they're throwing them, they're throwing them into the crowd to try and like draw all their attention to that. When you really want to get all of them away from that whole area and mm -hmm. draw as many from within out, 
all they'd have to do is go into the cop car that they were already in and turn on the siren and then run, go around the back. Very smart. And that would have also drawn all the zombies that are inside the school. It yeah. would have, but would it not have drawn more from outside in the forest and, and the surrounding community? And I, then I they think, can't get to their cop car. Well, the they aren't trying to get back to the cop car. They oh. never tried to get back to the cop car. Okay. So the, all the because they they went back to the truck, which is still parked a ways off. So they they really just went into the cop car because that's where the flares are. But all they had to do was turn on the the siren. So now we're back at the farm, and Rick wants to give more blood, and Lori and Herschel are like, "No, you've given too much." Then he wants to go and help Shane and Otis, and Lori and Herschel are like, "No, you can barely stand up." Rick, just just sit down. <laughs> just sit down, sit eat a sandwich. Down. And so back at the FEMA location, they're gathering supplies. Otis has a list, and they're really excited because they they gotten like everything on the list. But now, now that they've drawn all the zombies away with a flare, how do they get back out of the trailer? I mean, really, why didn't they think that through? How did they expect to get out once they got in? Hello? So they run into the high school, but they keep getting stopped by zombies and locked doors as they're going through. Shane shoots a glass door open and then kicks the gates together to keep the walkers out. And that is the end of our episode there. So a couple things with this episode. There was no one who was killed. Yay. Except for maybe some zombies going around there. And... Th- there wasn't really any musical things that happened either. So those two things, we got nothing. But let's talk about the comic connection for this episode. One thing that does happen is, like we said, Carl does get shot in the comics. That's about page 204. And they do take him to Herschel's farm. But when they meet Herschel, they find out that he has quite a few children. And their names are Lacey, Arnold, Maggie, Billy, Rachel, and Susie. Notice there is no Beth yeah. anywhere in there. Their neighbors are Otis and Patricia, and they came to stay with them at the farmhouse. But remember, it we say in the comic, Sophia never disappears in the comic. She's there. So she actually spends a lot of time with Carl while he's recovering and while he is hurt. They become even closer during that point. And then around about page 224, Herschel welcomes the group into his house and says, yes, you can stay here. So that is pretty much kind of what happened in this episode. This will be the last season with Frank Darabont. I know we still got a little bit of ways of it to go. And until this season is over, I'll probably still say the AMC low budget thing. They just didn't have the budget. And that is why Frank Darabont left. So extra consultants and extra accuracy on every little plot detail. Does it maybe, hopefully it gets better. We'll see. We will definitely see Mm -hmm. if these things get better. I think this episode is really good for kind of getting to the heart of some of the other issues surrounding some of these characters that we've had issues with for a while. And I think it's getting to the road where they are actually having to be confronted, where the issues with the disliked original characters have to be dealt with. Correct. And that is our show. Next week we are talking about Season 2, Episode 3, Save the Last One. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out. Yeah,